We are in chapter 20, part two. No, no, it is nothing, child, said the grandmother, wishing to reassure her. Just give me your hand that I may feel sure you are there. No doubt it would be the best thing for you, although I feel I could scarcely survive it. I do not want anything of the best if you could scarcely survive it, said Heidi, in such a determined tone of voice that the grandmother's fears increased as she felt sure the people from Frankfurt were coming to take Heidi back with them. Since now she was well again, they naturally wished to have her with them once more, but she was anxious to hide her trouble from Heidi if possible, as the latter was so sympathetic that she might refuse perhaps to go away and that would not be right. She sought for help but not for long, for she knew of only one. Heidi, she said, there is something that would comfort me and calm my thoughts. Read me the hymn beginning, All Things Will Work for Good. Heidi found the place at once and read out in her clear young voice, All things will work for good to those who trust in me. I come with healing on my wings to save and set thee free. Yes, yes, that is just what I wanted to hear, said the grandmother, and the deep expression of trouble passed from her face. Heidi looked at her thoughtfully for a minute or two and then said, Healing means that which cures everything and makes everybody well, doesn't it, grandmother? Yes, that is it, replied the old woman with a nod of assent. And we may be sure everything will come to pass according to God's good purpose. Read the verse again that we may remember it well and not forget it again. And Heidi read the words over two or three times, for she also found pleasure in this assurance of all things being arranged for the best. When the evening came, Heidi returned home up the mountain. The stars came out overhead one by one, so bright and sparkling that each seemed to send a fresh ray of joy into her heart. She was obliged to pause continually to look up, and as the whole sky at last grew spangled with them, she spoke aloud, Yes, I understand now why we feel so happy and are not afraid about anything, because God knows what is good and beautiful for us. And the stars with their glistening eyes continued to nod to her till she reached home, where she found her grandfather also standing and looking up at them, for they had seldom been more glorious than they were this night. Not only were the nights of this month of May so clear and bright, but the days as well. The sun rose every morning into the cloudless sky, as undimmed in its splendor as when it sank the evening before. And the grandfather would look out early and exclaim with astonishment, this is indeed a wonderful year of sun. It will make all the shrubs and plants grow apace. You will have to see, General, that your army does not get out of hand from overfeeding. And Peter would swing his stick with an air of assurance and an expression on his face, as much as to say, see to that. So May passed, everything growing greener and greener, and then came the month of June, with a hotter sun and long light days that brought the flowers out all over the mountain, so that every spot was bright with them and the air full of their sweet scents. This month, too, was drawing to its close when one day Heidi, having finished her domestic duties, ran out with the intention of paying first a visit to the fir trees and then going up higher to see if the bush of rock roses was yet in bloom, for its flowers were so lovely when standing open in the sun. But just as she was turning the corner of the hut, she gave such a loud cry that her grandfather came running out of the shed to see what had happened. Grandfather, grandfather, she cried, beside herself with excitement. Come here, look, look. The old man was by her side by this time and looked in the direction of her outstretched hand. A strange looking procession was making its way up the mountain. In front were two men carrying a sedan chair in which sat a girl well wrapped up in shawls, then followed a horse mounted by a stately looking woman who was looking about her with great interest and talking to the guide who walked beside her. Then a reclining chair, which was being pushed up by another man. It having evidently been thought safer to send the invalid to whom it belonged up the steep, steep path in a sedan chair. The procession wound up with a porter with such a bundle of cloaks, shawls, and fur on his back that it rose well above his head. Here they come, here they come, shouted Heidi, jumping with joy. And sure enough, it was the party from Frankfurt. The figures came nearer and nearer, and at last they had actually arrived. 
The men in front put down their burden. Heidi rushed forward, and the two children embraced each other with mutual delight. Grandmama, having also reached the top, dismounted and gave Heidi an affectionate greeting before turning to the grandfather, who had meanwhile come up to welcome his guests. There was no constraint about the meeting, for they both knew each other perfectly well from hearsay and felt like old acquaintances. After the first words of greeting had been exchanged, Grandmama broke out into lively expressions of admiration. What a magnificent residence you have, Uncle. I could hardly have believed it was so beautiful. A king might well envy you, and how well my little Heidi looks, like a wild rose. She continued, drawing the child towards her and stroking her fresh pink cheeks. I don't know which way to look first. It is all so lovely. What do you say to it, Clara? What do you say? Clara was gazing around entranced. She had never imagined, much less seen, anything so beautiful. She gave vent to her delight in cries of joy. Oh, Grandmama, she said, I should like to remain here forever. The grandfather had meanwhile drawn up the invalid chair and spread some of the wraps over it. He now went up to Clara. Supposing we carry the little daughter now to her accustomed chair, I think she will be more comfortable. The traveling sedan is rather hard. He said, and without waiting for anyone to help him, he lifted the child in his strong arms and laid her gently down on her own couch. He then covered her over carefully and arranged her feet on the soft cushion, as if he had never done anything all his life but attend on cripples. The grandmama looked on with surprise. My dear uncle, she exclaimed, if I knew where you had learned to nurse, I would at once send all the nurses I know to the same place that they might handle their patients in like manner. How do you come to know so much? Uncle smiled. I know more from experience than training, he answered, but as he spoke, the smile died away and a look of sadness passed over his face. The vision rose before him of a face of suffering that he had known long years before, the face of a man lying crippled on his couch of pain and unable to move a limb. The man had been his captain during the fi fierce fighting in Sicily. He had found him lying wounded and had carried him away, and after that, the captain would suffer no one else near him, and uncle had stayed and nursed him till his sufferings ended in death. It all came back to Uncle now, and it seemed natural to him to attend on the sick Clara and to show her all those kindly attentions with which he had been so familiar. The sky spread blue and cloudless over the hut and the fir trees and far above over the high rocks, the gray summits of which glistened in the sun. Clara could not feast her eyes enough on all the beauty around her. Oh, Heidi, if only I could walk about with you, she said longingly. If I could but go and look at the fir trees and, the, and at everything I know so well from your description, although I have never been here before. This, Heidi, in response, put out all her strength and after a slight effort, managed to wheel Clara's chair quite easily round the hut to the fir trees. There they paused. Clara had never seen such trees before with their tall, straight stems and long, thick branches growing thicker and thicker till they touched the ground. Even the grandmama, who had followed the children, was astonished at the sight of them. She hardly knew what to admire most in these ancient trees, the lofty tops rising in their full green splendor towards the sky, or the pillar-like stems with their straight and gigantic boughs that spoke of such antiquity of age, of such long years during which they had looked down upon the valley below, where men came and went, and all things were continually changing, while they stood undisturbed and changeless. Heidi had now wheeled Clara onto the goat shed and had flung open the door so that Clara might have a full view of all that was inside. There was not much to see just now as, it, as its indwellers were absent. Clara lamented to her grandmother that they would have to leave early before the goats came home. I should so like to have seen Peter and his whole flock. Dear child, let us enjoy all the beautiful things that we can see and not think about those things that we cannot. Grandmama replied as she followed the chair, which Heidi was pushing further on. Oh, the flowers, exclaimed Clara. Look at the bushes of red flowers and all the nodding bluebells. Oh, if I could but get up and pick some. 
Heidi ran off at once and picked her a large nosegay of them. But these are nothing, Clara, she said, laying the flowers on her lap. If you could come up higher to where the goats are feeding, then you would indeed see something. Bushes on bushes of the red centauri and ever so many more of the bluebell flowers. And then the bright yellow rock roses that gleam like pure gold and all crowding together in the one spot. And then there are others with the large leaves that grandfather calls bright eyes and the brown ones with little, little, little round heads that smell so delicious. Oh, it is beautiful up there. And if you sit down among them, you never want to get up again. Everything looks and smells so lovely. Heidi's eyes sparkled with the remembrance of what she was describing. She was longing herself to see it all again, and Clara caught her enthusiasm and looked back at her with equal longing in her soft blue eyes. Grandmama, do you think I could get up there? Is it possible for me to go? She asked eagerly. If only I could walk, climb about everywhere with you, Heidi. I am sure I could push you up. The chair goes so easily, said Heidi. And in proof of her words, she sent the chair at such a pace round the corner that it nearly went flying down the mountainside. Grandmama, being at hand, however, stopped it in time. The grandfather, meantime, had not been idle. He had by this time put the table and extra chairs in front of the seat so that they might all sit out here and eat the dinner that was preparing inside. The milk and the cheese were soon ready, and when the company sat down in high spirits to their midday meal, Grandmama was enchanted, as the doctor had been, with their dining room, whence one could see far along the valley and far over the mountains to the farthest stretch of blue sky. A light wind blew refreshingly over them as they sat at table, and the rustling of the fir trees made a festive accompaniment to the repast. I never enjoyed anything as much as this. It is really superb, cried Grandmama two or three times over, and then suddenly in a tone of surprise, do I really see you taking a second piece of toasted cheese, Clara? There, sure enough, was a second golden colored slice of cheese on Clara's plate. Oh, it does taste so nice, Grandmama, better than all the dishes we have at Regat's, replied Clara as she continued eating with appetite. That's right, eat what you can, exclaimed Uncle. It's the mountain air which makes up for the deficiencies of the kitchen. And so the meal went on. Grandmama and Elm Uncle got on very well together and their conversation became more and more lively. They were so thoroughly agreed in their opinions of men and things and the world in general that they might have been taken for old cronies. The time passed merrily and then Grandmama looked towards the west and said, we must soon get ready to go, Clara. The sun is a good way down. The men will be here directly with the horse and sedan. Clara's face fell and she said beseechingly, oh, just another hour, Grandmama, or two hours. We haven't seen inside the hut yet or Heidi's bed or any of the other things. If only the day was 10 hours long. Well, that is not possible, said Grandmama, but she herself was anxious to see inside the hut. So they all rose from the table and Uncle wheeled Clara's chair to the door. But there they came to a standstill, for the chair was much too broad to pass through the door. Uncle, however, soon settled the difficulty by lifting Clara in his strong arms and carrying her inside. Grandmama went all around and examined the household arrangements and was very much amused and pleased at their orderliness and the cozy appearance of everything. And this is your bedroom up here, Heidi, is it not? She asked as without trepidation, she mounted the ladder to the hayloft. Oh, it does smell sweet. What a healthy place to sleep in. She went up to the round window and looked out and grandfather followed up with Clara in his arms, Heidi springing up after them. Then they all stood and examined Heidi's wonderful hay bed and grandmama looked thoughtfully at it and drew in from time to time fragrant draughts of the hay perfumed air while Clara was charmed beyond words with Heidi's sleeping apartment. It is delightful for you up here, Heidi. You can look from your bed straight into the sky and then such a delicious smell around you and outside the fir trees waving and rustling. I have never seen such a pleasant, cheerful bedroom before. Uncle looked across at the grandmama. I've been thinking, he said to her, that if you were willing to agree to it, your little granddaughter might remain up here and I am sure she would grow stronger. You have brought up all kinds of shawls and covers with you and we could make up a soft bed out of them. And as to the general looking after the child, you need have no fear, for I will see to that. 
Clara and Heidi were as overjoyed at these words as if they were two birds let out of their cages, and Grandmama's face beamed with satisfaction. You are indeed kind, my dear uncle, she exclaimed. You give words to the thought that was in my own mind. I was only asking myself whether a stay up here might not be the very thing she wanted. But then the trouble, the inconvenience to yourself, and you speak of nursing and looking after her as if it was a mere nothing. I thank you sincerely. I thank you from my whole heart, uncle. And she took his hand and gave it a long and grateful shake, which he returned with a pleased expression of countenance. Uncle immediately set to work to get things ready. He carried, carried Clara back to her chair outside, Heidi following, not knowing how to jump high enough into the air to express her contentment. Then he gathered up a whole pile of shawls and furs and said, smiling, it is a good thing that Grandmama came up well prepared for a winter's campaign. We shall be able to make good use of these. Foresight is a virtue, responded the lady amused, and prevents many misfortunes. If we have made the journey over your mountains without meeting with storms, winds, and cloud bursts, we can only be thankful, which we are, and my provision against these disasters now comes in usefully, as you say. The two had meanwhile ascended to the hayloft and began to prepare a bed. There were so many articles piled one over the other that when finished, it looked like a regular little fortress. Grandmama passed her hand carefully over it to make sure there were no bits of hay sticking out. If there's a bit that can come through, it will, she said. The soft mattress, however, was so smooth and thick that nothing could penetrate it. Then they went down again, well satisfied, and found the children laughing and talking together and arranging all they were going to do from morning till evening as long as Clara stayed. The next question was how long she was to remain, and first Grandmama was asked, but she referred them to the grandfather, who gave it as his opinion that she ought to make the trial of the mountain air for at least a month. The children clapped their hands for joy, for they had not expected to be together for so long a time. The bearers and the horse and guide were now seen approaching. The former were sent back at once, and Grandmama prepared to mount for her return journey. It's not saying goodbye, Grandmama, Clara called out, for you will come up now and then and see how we are getting on, and we shall so look forward to your visits, shan't we, Heidi? Heidi, who felt that life this day had been crowded with pleasures, could only respond to Clara with another jump of joy. Grandmama, being now seated on her sturdy animal, Uncle took the bridle to lead her down the steep mountain path. She begged him not to come far with her, but he insisted on seeing her safely as far as Dorfley, for the way was precipitous and not without danger for the rider, he said. Grandmama did not care to stay alone in Dorfley and therefore decided to return to Regatz and thence to make excursions up the mountain from time to time. Peter came down with his goats before Uncle had returned. As soon as the animals caught sight of Heidi, they all came flocking towards her, and she, as well as Clara on her couch, were soon surrounded by the goats, pushing and poking their heads one over the other, while Heidi introduced each in turn by its name to her friend Clara. It was not long before the latter had made the long wished for acquaintance of Little Snowflake, the lively Greenfinch, and the well-behaved goats belonging to Grandfather, as well as of the many others, including the Grand Turk, Peter, meanwhile, stood apart looking on and casting somewhat unfriendly glances toward Clara. Then, when the two children called out, Good evening, Peter, he made no answer, but swung up his stick angrily, as if wanting to cut the air in two, and then ran off with his goats after him. The climax to all the beautiful things that Clara had already seen upon the mountain came at the close of the day. As she lay on the large soft bed in the hayloft with Heidi near her, she looked out through the round open window right into the middle of the shining clusters of stars and she exclaimed in delight, Heidi, it's just as if we were in a high carriage and we're going to drive straight into heaven. Yes, and do you know why the stars are so happy and look down and nod to us like that? asked Heidi. No, why is it? Clara asked in return. Because they live up in heaven and know how well God arranges everything for us so that we need have no more fear or trouble and may be quite sure that all things will come right in the end. That's why they are so happy. And they nod to us because they want us to be happy too. And when then we must never forget to pray and to ask God to remember us when he is arranging things so that we too may feel safe and have no anxiety about what is going to happen. 
The two children now sat up and said their prayers, and then Heidi put her head down on her little round arm and fell off to sleep at once. But Clara lay awake some time, for she could not get over the wonder of this new experience of being in bed up here among the stars. She had indeed seldom seen a star, for she never went outside the house at night, and the curtains at home were always drawn before the stars came out. Each time she closed her eyes, she felt she must open them again to see if the two very large stars were still looking in, and nodding to her as Heidi said they did. There they were, always in the same place, and Clara felt she could not look long enough into their bright sparkling faces, until at last her eyes closed of their own accord, and it was only in her dreams that she still saw the two large, friendly stars shining down upon her. We'll read the next chapter tomorrow, How Life Went On at Grandfather's. See you then.